Hello everyone, I would like to welcome you to the CHCI Health Summit session called Prescription Drugs, Access and Affordability for Underserved Communities. My name is Stephanie Pozuelos and I am a CHCI alum. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Pharma and AARP for their generous support of this session. Before we begin our panel, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our panel hosts, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia and Congressman Mark Vesey and our moderator, Dr. Elena V. Rios. Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in November 2018, becoming the first Latina ever to represent the Texas 29th Congressional District. As a social worker and legal aid lawyer early in her professional career, she sought to protect her community's most vulnerable, old and young, and to ensure no one was forgotten. She proudly serves on the House Judiciary and House Financial Services Committees. We are so glad to have you here today. Next is Congressman V.C. He proudly represents Texas' newly drawn Congressional 33rd District in the U.S. House of Representatives. Representative V.C. is an advocate for Texas middle-class middle families and is committed to creating jobs, improving public education, fighting for immigration reform, and ensuring access to quality health care and women's reproductive rights. Thank you for being here, Representative VC. Our moderator for today is none other than Dr. Elena Rios. Dr. Rios serves as the president and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association, representing 50,000 Hispanic physicians in the United States. The mission of the organization is to improve the health of Hispanics. Dr. Rios also serves as the president of the National Hispanic Medical Association's National Hispanic Health Foundation to direct educational and research activities. We're so honored to have you all join us and with such a distinguished panel of leading experts and distinguished guests during our, this session. This session will examine access and affordability to prescription drugs and policies that help lead to innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. Welcome viewers, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy this panel. And don't forget to continue the conversation by posting your comments and by asking questions on social media using the hashtag, hashtag CHCI Summit. And now to you, Congresswoman Garcia, and then we'll hear from Congressman VC. Hello, everyone. This is Houston Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, and I'm thrilled to be joining y'all today. While I wish I could be joining you in person, I'm happy to be providing some pre-recorded remarks. I want to thank CHCI for organizing this summit and such an important topic for the Latino community. Before COVID-19, Latinos were already disproportionately affected by pre-existing conditions such as asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. It was also harder for Latinos to access healthcare due to language barriers, lack of transportation, and many other factors. And before this pandemic, many in our community were already having to decide between buying their prescription drugs or putting food on the table. All of this has been exacerbated by COVID-19. This pandemic has demonstrated why we must protect and expand the Affordable Care Act, as well as reduce the price of prescription drugs. Almost a year ago in December, 228 Democrats and only two Republicans voted for HR3 a life-saving bill to reduce the cost of prescription drugs. Unfortunately, like many other bills passed in the House, H.R. 3 is stuck on McConnell's desk. In light of COVID-19, we must be working together to offer COVID-19 relief to families, expand access to health care, and reduce the cost of prescription drugs. We have a responsibility to get this done for the good of our community in our country. With that, I hope you have a wonderful conversation and a wonderful summit. Thank you and muchísimas gracias. God bless. Hi, this is Mark VC, Congressman for the 33rd Congressional District in Dallas-Fort Worth. And I want to take the time to thank the Congressional Hispanic uh, Caucus Institute for their annual health care summit. Uh, this is very important that we have this discussion. Uh, I represent a majority Latino district and about a third or more of the constituents that I represent don't have health care insurance. And of course, with everything going on right now with the pandemic that we're in, all of these health care issues have really been exacerbated. Uh, we need to find out exactly how this is affecting people's uh, health care, 
uh, what the uh, outcomes may uh, be uh, once we get in a post-COVID environment. Uh, all of these discussions are very serious uh, and I'm certainly glad that they're being uh, hailed today. Uh, also, we need to continue to have a conversation about pharmaceutical drugs and uh, the affordability uh, of them and how we're going to bring those prices down. So uh, I want to, again, just congratulate uh, CHCI for everything that they're doing uh, to bring attention to something uh, that we need to continue to have discussions about uh, that affects uh, all of our communities. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Elena Rios, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association. Our mission is to improve the health of Hispanics with all our public and private partners. And today we're with one of our partners, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Very happy to be here. Today's uh, discussion will be on prescription drugs, access and affordability for underserved communities. Prescription drugs can treat previously untreatable and rare illnesses leading to improved health and healthier life expectancy. Unfortunately, while medically promising, these innovations are out of reach for many Latinos who are likely to suffer disproportionately from health conditions such as asthma, cancer, liver disease, tuberculosis, obesity, HIV, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. In the wake of several drug pricing reforms on the horizon, including recently passed legislation to lower drug prices, session speakers will discuss policy recommendations that promote innovation in the pharmaceutical industry, while at the same time improving access and affordability for life-saving medications for all our Latino communities. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three panelists today. Our first, is Mr. Kenneth Romero, Executive Director, National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. Ken? Thank you very much, Dr. Rios. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. I want to especially thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for this opportunity. As you know, the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators considers the issue of health and wellness one of its key policy priorities. And HCSL is leading a strategic effort right now to inform Hispanic state legislators about the most pressing issues facing our community and affording them with the opportunity to engage in conversations with national health experts about various issues, including obesity, chronic disease, uh, mental health, and the pandemic. So I, I really thank you for this opportunity and look forward to this conversation. Amy Kelbeck, Senior Legislative Representative from AARP. Amy? Thank you. Thank you so much for including us to the, in today's discussion. Lowering prescription drug prices is a top priority for AARP. The average senior takes four to five medications every single month, typically on a chronic basis. The median annual income for a Medicare beneficiary is $26,000 a year, and the price of prescription drugs continues to increase. In 2018, the price of prescription drugs widely used by older Americans increased at twice the rate of inflation. So older Americans take a lot of prescription drugs, don't have a lot of disposable income, and continue to see the prices of needed medications increase. Older adults are also very much anticipating the uh, arrival of a COVID-19 vaccine or therapeutics. We're also very interested in clinical trial design and transparency around those processes. But overall, AARP members are very, very focused on the issue of prescription drug prices and ongoing developments in this space. Thanks so much. Deputy Vice President, Advocacy and Strategic Alliances from Pharma. Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Rios. It's a pleasure to be here today. As you mentioned, my name is Marissa Watkins. I work on the Alliance team at Pharma, which is the trade association that represents America's biopharmaceutical companies which are devoted to discovering and developing medicines that pa help patients live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. We recognize that there are significant issues that people face in accessing their medicines. Everything from cost to insurance design place hurdles in the, in the way of people's care. This is now even more of an issue for the Latinx community because of the pandemic. America's biopharmaceutical companies are committed to advancing policy solutions and research to better address health disparities, especially in light of the pandemic where we are working at breakneck speed to create treatments and vaccines. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. The first 
first answer to this question. Uh, how are underserved communities, especially with AARP and especially Latino communities, how are they impacted by limited access to affordable life-saving medications? Thank you for the question. So a lot of the conditions that you outlined that um, especially impact Hispanic communities are have some of the highest brand name drug prices associated with them. And I think it's really important when we talk about drug pricing to really think about where those issues are. The folks that take generic medications generally aren't suffering from you know, unaffordable out-of-pocket costs. It's folks that are on chronic medications and those medications are brand name drugs that really have trouble affording the out-of-pocket costs associated with those medications. And typically those medications are used to treat uh, chronic diseases such as asthma, COPD, high cholesterol, diabetes. And we know that those are conditions the Hispanic community disproportionately suffers from. Of uh, Medicare Part D spending, 17% of all Part D spending was spent on just the top 10 drugs. So when we're really looking at this issue, we are really looking at those same conditions and the drugs used to treat them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kenneth, uh, what do you think is the economic downturn? How do you think that uh, it, it will impact the progress uh, toward any actions to improve access? I know you work in the, in the policy arena uh, with different states. Uh, I know uh, it's important to to know that every state's a little different. Any comments on that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first problem that we need to address is that a lot of people during the pandemic, particularly in the Hispanic community, uh, lost their jobs and therefore they lost their private health insurance as part of that. Uh, in fact, 3.1 million adults in the United States lost their insurance so far. Now, some of them have been able to access the Affordable Care Act of Obamacare uh, and so the drop there in, in the uninsured hasn't been as as great, but it's important to note that the majority of of them are Hispanic. Uh, what this has actually uh, made us realize, right, as as a nation, is that we need to structurally address the issue of health insurance, and that we have to decouple employment from access to health insurance, right? The idea that you shouldn't have to be employed in order to have insurance. And so what, that's why you've seen uh, in, in recent months that polls show that now an overwhelming majority of Americans are more supportive of something along those uh, the lines of making sure that everybody has health insurance, whether that takes uh, the shape of Medicare for all or other alternatives, uh, we, we can discuss, but that's something that is critical, uh, critically important to Latinos. So you mentioned the importance of, of having um, uh, some other way to pay for medications. Uh, one way is to look at prices in other countries. Can I ask, uh, Marissa, could you comment on the, do you support aligning drug prices in the United States with prices paid for prescription drugs in other developed countries that might be a little cheaper? Thank you, Dr. Rios. That's a really good question. And I think on paper, a lot of people think that makes sense. However, when you look at other countries, especially the countries that um, recent proposals have considered importing the price controls from, they face significant access restrictions. This means there are delays in care. And we know that when people face delays in care, it impacts their quality of life, it impacts caregivers. So we don't support allowing for foreign price controls to um, be used in, uh, in the US. We think there are other proposals that will actually impact what beneficiaries are paying their out-of-pocket costs. And I thank Amy for raising some of the points about the spending in Part D. Uh, the industry is very supportive of creating an out-of-pocket cap in Medicare Part D so that spending per beneficiary is limited. We think that could go a really long way in helping people have more predictable costs. There are also proposals out there to lower what pay patients are paying as they move throughout the benefit uh, and also smoothing the payment so that people have a little bit more predictability in what they're paying every month. So instead of kind of dragging over these access restrictions through price controls, we think there are real things that uh, Congress and the administration can focus on that will actually help beneficiaries. Great. And now I know when you said Part D, that was Medicare Part D, and these are yes, federal sorry. government policies that people in our audience should be aware of. 
Uh, now I want to switch to Ken and talk about state policies. So very different because there are 50 different states and Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. and all the territories. And Ken, has there been any progress at the state level? Uh, we, we know in 2019, 26 state legislatures passed 40 bills about drug pricing uh, from importation to affordability. And so far in 2020, 11 new laws to rein in drug prices have been passed in eight states. Uh, can you comment on what do you foresee in 2021 for some state policy priorities? Well, I think the main focus is going to be in Maryland. As you know, Maryland was the first state to end uh, a, what is called the Prescription uh, Drug Affordability Board uh, through legislation that, interestingly enough, was sponsored uh, by a Hispanic uh, uh, legislator in Maryland, Delegate uh, Jocelyn Peña Melnick. And what it does is it creates an independent body with authority to evaluate more costly drugs and recommend appropriate methods for addressing these costs. Uh, now, the new board will look at prescription drugs with costs that greatly impact you know, uh, residents in Maryland, including medications that impact budgets at the local and state level. But what's important to note is that these boards cannot literally uh, cap prescription prices. What they're going to do is they're going to recommend upper payment limits uh, that local governments uh, would agree uh, to pay for a, for a drug. So the first report, they actually met earlier this year for the first time, and the, their report will come out in 2022. So a lot of states will be looking at that as guidance of what should be reasonable results. Very good. Okay, so lots of exciting things happening. And I guess with COVID-19, there'll be even more discussion on on uh, therapeutic prices for COVID-19, uh, which are going to be mm -hmm. very important. Let me ask uh, Amy, uh, how can healthcare providers, uh, it, especially who take care of the elderly, who are the most uh, chronically ill in our communities, how can the providers combat the stigma of prescription drugs? Because so many of our communities, you know, take their own traditional medicines, teas, herbs, and, you know, it's so important to educate our community about the importance of taking medications that the doctor prescribes, you know, talking to the pharmacist about what is the medication I'm taking. In other words, we need to be able to have programs that better educate our communities. Uh, right. But what do, you think, what, what do you think ARP can do in this to help us? I think right now a really big opportunity before us is around the COVID-19 vaccine. You know, there's been a lot of vaccine hesitancy in this country over the last couple of years. And unfortunately, I think that that's growing. I think that the COVID-19 presents us with an opportunity to build confidence in the institutions that develop, review, and approve prescription drugs. But that means that those institutions have to be willing to be more transparent than they ever have been before. One thing that we've been advocating for as it pertains to older Americans is clinical trial data, specifically phase three data of how each vaccine um, performs on older Americans and then older Americans broken up by demographic. We know that yeah. in most cases, uh, older Americans are gonna trust their provider to give them reliable healthcare information, but we need to make sure that those providers have the information to give them to begin with. And so, you know, one thing that we've really been advocating for is to understand how these vaccines are performing on the 60 plus, especially those with comorbidities. The 65 plus, especially those in congregate living settings are really at the top of everyone's kind of prioritization list when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines. So if you're asking those folks to take this vaccine at the top of the line, you need to be able to demonstrate to them that it's safe and effective. So I think yeah. that that's really a great opportunity right now to build confidence in our overall prescription drug safe and effectiveness, you know, when approval process. Okay. If so I, we're talking about the, I'm sorry, Ken, do you have a comment? Yeah, if I may, I'd like to add to this. This is something that is uh, very important to the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislators. And we've been working around the issue about making sure that uh, patients adhere to medical treatment, right? And one of the things, one of the challenges we've seen has to do with the issue of deceptive lawsuit advertisement. We need to stop 
deceptive healthcare lawsuits uh, advertisements because what they do is oftentimes you see a patient who based on a TV ad they see or a billboard that they see while they're driving their car, all of a sudden they stop taking a prescribed medication which is still the, the ideal medication to treat a condition. And they do this without consulting a doctor because of the deceptiveness of the information on that ad. And so we need to make sure that we address that issue. We need to make sure that patients are adhering to their treatment. Yeah, our community tends to be very vulnerable. Uh, I think, and, and I think health literacy and the importance of communications can't be understated, overstated. Uh, so, so let me just ask a question about innovations, because we are here to talk about the importance of innovations too. Uh, Marissa, question, what innovations in the pharmaceutical industry are currently happening or should be happening to provide better quality life-saving medications? Well, I think that's a, a really timely question. Obviously, we're all very focused on the pandemic and what's happening uh, there and the impact that it's had on all of our lives. The good news coming out over the past week and a half of the two vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, the promising data that has come from that, I think has given people a lot of hope. I think the next step, which both Amy and Ken uh, brought up, is really making sure that the public trusts in the process um, and that both um, as the vaccines are being created and tested, um, that there is a diversity in the clinical trial pipeline. Um, and I think the companies that have so far undertaken this, this huge risk have done a wonderful job. The Pfizer vaccine has had over 30% um, from black and brown uh, communities. And so we think that um, that data alone will be very telling in helping people trust in the process. Uh, I think Amy, you're right in working with providers and meeting people where they are, making sure that people understand um, uh, uh, the safety behind the process that has happened is going to be incredibly important. Um, and I think working with groups like CHCI and others to really spread the message, to learn, to be in the community and help people is ultimately going to be what's going to lead to the success of, of everyone um, benefiting from the innovation that's currently happening. Okay, I'm, I have a couple questions from the audience. I just want to read a couple uh, from Vincent Barragon in New Jersey. Uh, and I think this is also to you, Marissa, but I'm sure the others might have a comment. What do you think is the Latino community participation in access programs? Uh, you already mentioned the importance of one clinical trial, but in clinical trials overall participating uh, with the industry, uh, at the, is it at the same rate as other groups? I would say, unfortunately not. The industry um, hasn't done a spectacular job in the past of recruiting for clinical trials, but I think with everything that has happened, they have absolutely made a shift change here. Uh, we actually have released new principles on diversity in clinical trials, and that includes everything from looking at the location sites so that they're in more diverse locations, ensuring there's diversity among the investigators. I think it's really telling my boss, who is a physician and also works in healthcare policy, volunteered for the Moderna vaccine, and he you know, walked us through the process, and he himself thought it was overwhelming to kind of go through the entire process. So I think really helping people understand, again, meeting them where they are <clears throat> and making sure there's diversity in the entire spectrum of the clinical trial is incredibly important. And I think working with groups like CHCI and other patient navigators is going to be so important. So I think that there's a yeah. lot of opportunity here uh, to grow and to learn uh, and ultimately to make it so that there is very robust participation across the board. So I think that there's a lot a lot to learn and a lot to grow. Uh, Ken, on the same vein, another question from Yvette Maldonado from Maryland. We need comprehensive and expanded programs that help Latinos, that are targeted to Latinos, have the ability to get medication and treatments that they need. Uh, however, many state and local programs already exist, but our communities don't know they exist. What can you do, Ken, with your organization to help uh, increase uh, education at, at, a, at a community level? Let me start by saying that the community is not the problem. It's the, we need, you know, a, 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 the stakeholders that uh, are working in terms of making these uh, medications, treatments, programs available, we need to do a better job. And so 
Uh, in a way, uh, I, I appreciate what Marissa was mentioning um, around making sure, for example, that uh, 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 patients actually have access and understand how they can tap into resources like discount programs and free medication programs. Uh, I certainly value the fact that uh, many of the uh, pharmaceutical industry members uh, have multicultural advisory councils uh, where different stakeholders are working with pharmaceutical industry to provide that lens of, of, of racial, ethnic, and different minority groups to make sure that we are improving every day the job of educating our community on these programs. Okay. I, uh, I, I think those were a couple of good questions and answers uh, to educate our audience. Um, is there any uh, priority, other priorities that you're working on in this area that I might, that we may have missed? Amy, is there another priority? Sure. So, um, you know, ARP has really made prescription drugs our focus issue. In March of uh, 2019, we launched our Stop Rx Greed campaign. And so at the federal level, we've been really focused on HR3, which is the bill that was sponsored largely by House Republic, by House Democrats, but passed on a bipartisan basis. And then also the grassley widen bill that was uh, passed on a bipartisan basis out of the Senate Finance Committee. We're really focused on reforms that tackle both prescription drug prices and prescription drug costs. We don't wanna just move money around within the system. We really wanna get at the root of the problem, which is the high price of prescription drugs. So we support solutions like Medicare negotiation. We support inflation-based rebates for Medicare Part B and Part D. And we also support an out-of-pocket cap for Medicare Part D. That's really important because you know, millions of Medicare beneficiaries mm -hmm. are reaching out of pocket or reaching the catastrophic phase right now where they still face costs throughout the year. But at the same time, we really want to make sure that any kind of out-of-pocket cap doesn't add both premium increases or to Medicare spending. So we really feel that the pharmaceutical industry needs to have meaningful and proportional liability in any kind of redesign of the Medicare Part D program. And those are our top priorities in the pharmaceutical and the prescription drug space. Okay, Marissa, as a representative of pharma, could you could you tell us what your priorities are and if there was something that Amy mentioned that you'd like to uh, provide your, you know, your uh, perspective, just to have a balanced yeah, perspective. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I think, Dr. Rios, you actually put it really well in your opening statement. There's a combination of innovation, access, and affordability, and I think those are our three goals. Um, at, at this time, I think, Amy, you, you put it really well, beneficiaries are paying too much in the Part D program, um, and there are some real reforms out there that could help alleviate some of that. But I think we need to really consider the impact that it could have on innovation and also access. As I mentioned before, um, the, the thought of kind of tying drug prices or allowing for government interfer interference ultimately could result in, in serious access issues. And I would say at a time when we're really depending on the innovation of the pharmaceutical industry to um, do anything that would negatively impact that at this time just seems like we're taking steps backwards. I, I think there is a way that we can come to common ground and find solutions here. I think it's going to take a lot of people coming together, uh, and I'm hopeful that um, in the next Congress and with the new administration, uh, there are some new ideas that could be brought forward that would really address patient affordability. Mm -hmm. And Ken, do you have any uh, other priorities that we may have missed on this issue of, of pharmaceutical medications for Latino patients? Yes, uh, we're actually approaching it from a different perspective. We're looking at out of cost, uh, out of pocket expenses, and just in general, you know, the, the cost of living, uh, uh, particularly during a pandemic. Uh, we're calling uh, on Congress to adjust federal relief uh, to account for the disproportionate burdens, uh, particularly to the urban poor and other high cost uh, living areas. As you know, Hispanics tend to be concentrated in large cities and when you look at what happened now uh, so far with COVID and the CARES Act, uh, we feel that uh, the amount of relief that was provided disproportionately shortchanged 
uh, those folks living in high cost areas. And so we have been working with Congress. One of the things we did originally, the CARES Act included a penalty for people making under $23,500. They were only going to get a $600 check. And so we worked with Congress to make sure that they had a full $1,200 check, just like everybody else, because we need to make sure that when we're looking at these uh, relief programs, that we're addressing the urban poor, which are not so obvious because you would think that you live in a city, right? And, and, and one tends to associate uh, poverty with rural areas. But these are issues that are very important also to, to cities and, and to Hispanics that live in those cities. So uh, that's our main priority this year. And we look forward to working with uh, the uh, president-elect and the new Congress in Jan starting in January to make sure that any future programs address this issue. Uh, I have a question for AARP, for Amy. Uh, you've talked a lot about Medicare and the importance of Medicare Part D, which covers medications. Could you tell us about, just in general, some other uh, policy areas that AARP is focused on uh, to help the affordability of, of uh, medications for our communities? Sure, sure. So I think one of the big kind of misconceptions is that Medicare makes healthcare really affordable. Medicare is excellent coverage, but there are still a lot of costs associated with the care that's received uh, under Medicare. So if you receive a prescription drug under Medicare Part B, these are typically drugs that are provided in an outpatient setting. So think chemo, think an infusion, you will face a 20 percent cost for those drugs. So if you're undergoing ongoing chemotherapy and you do not have a Medicare Part B sub, every single time you go in for a chemotherapy treatment, you will be paying 20% of the cost of that cancer drug. And we see cancer drugs coming to market with prices of $100,000, $200,000. So 20% of that ongoing basis is unsustainable. And there's no out of pop in Medicare Part B unless you have an unless you have a supplement, which can have high premiums associated with that. And that's your Medicare. And overall, prescription drugs account for 20% of all care spending. And that's both including prescription drug spending under Medicare Part B and Medicare Part D. And in Medicare Part D, as I've said before, you know, it really is the brand name drugs that are really driving up spending in that program. The top 10 drugs account for 17% of all spending in the Part D program. And it's really drugs that we see with limited or no competition. And at the same time, there's no out-of-pocket cap. So we see, you know, a tenfold increase in seniors who get to what's known as the catastrophic phase of Medicare Part D on a single fill of a prescription. If you're on the cancer drug Revlimid, you literally blow through the Part D benefit when you fill that drug one time in January. And so, you know, we really want to make sure that the Part D program is sustainable for the future. And that means both capping out-of-pocket costs, but also shifting around the liability in the program. Right now, beneficiaries and the Medicare program take on too much of the cost of Part D. We advocate for shifting some of those costs to manufacturers. And that's been proposed at, in HR3, in the House Republican Alternative to HR3, in the Grassley-Wyden bill, and in the Crapo bill. So there really is broad consensus around redesigning the Part D program and shifting that liability. Can you uh, address the other Medicare program called Medicare Advantage? And is there a difference in the cost of medications uh, through Medicare Advantage? So Medicare Advantage structures its prescription drug coverage the same as Medicare Part D. So when we talk about reforms being made to Medicare Part D, what we're really saying is Medicare Part D and Medicare Advantage. So if you impose an out-of-pocket cap on Medicare Part D, Medicare Advantage patients will feel those same benefits. Oh, okay, just to clarify. Uh, Ken, can you uh, talk about the importance of why you think we should have uh, increased education to Latinos about uh, patient assistance programs, and maybe Marissa can tell us what those are. But uh, Ken, what, why do we need uh, education about these programs? I think the best example of why it's so critically important is what happened in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. Uh, a lot of these uh, patient assistance programs are based on you having access to internet, going online, 
uh, you know, identifying your medication and seeing what program is available to reduce the impact on your on your pocket. And so after a hurricane, uh, you know, devastating the entire infrastructure in Puerto Rico with no access to electricity, no access to the Internet and no access even to your pharmacy, uh, it was important to re-engineer these programs to be able to uh, provide the much needed uh, medication to these patients. And so uh, NHCSL uh, took, took it upon it itself to uh, sit down with, with the pharmaceutical industry and, and actually we were able to uh, re-engineer in very little time because it was, I mean, literally people that don't take medication could die after just a few days, right? And they were able to pivot and they established an alternate system where by call over the phone, where there were Spanish speaking operators and you would you did not need access to a computer to be able to uh, complete uh, the application process and then have access uh, and having that medication sent directly to you uh, as opposed to having it, uh, having to pick it up at a pharmacy or having to go to your doctor to pick it up. So that was a very quick uh, move. Uh, uh, for the benefit of the patients. Okay. Uh, uh, and Marissa, could you tell the audience uh, how important uh, your programs are? And I know there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies and they must all have a different type of patient assistance program, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, how, what is the bottom line? What is the basic fundamental principle behind these programs? And uh, maybe give you an, give us an example of how they work. Sure. So I think uh, the, the kind of bottom line here is that as discussions are happening about making major reforms to prescri prescription drug pricing and access, we kind of view this as a safety net program. So companies set up individual programs where you can apply to see there is any sort of financial assistance to help pay for a portion or all of your out-of-pocket costs for your prescription. Uh, these systems at one point were all separate uh, and a little bit harder to use. So the companies came together and created a sort of clearinghouse where it's swapping. People can enter in their information and see what sort of assistance is available for them. They can do that by visiting a website called MAT, M-A-T, assistancetool.org. And as I said before, we don't see this as kind of a silver bullet to fixing the drug pricing and access problems. Uh, we're hopeful that real reforms can take place. But in the meantime, and especially during the pandemic, as health insurance kind of fluctuates, people lose their jobs, we're hopeful that the safety net can um, be there for people. And as the pandemic really got serious, uh, and the e economic downturn also um, ha had people lose uh, a lot of their jobs, the companies actually expanded the programs from um, how they had been in the beginning of the year. So I think companies really view this as an important tool for people at the moment. Um, and again, kind of a stepping stool to hopefully reforms that can happen. And I think, Ken, it's, it's encouraging to hear that it's able to work in places like Puerto Rico. We also have another program that we work with called Healthcare Ready. Uh, that helps when there are natural disasters and now also uh, the pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, in the beginning, there were all sorts of supply chain issues and drug shortages. Healthcare Ready really stepped in and helped address a lot of those things nationally. Um, so if you're experiencing a situation where your pharmacy doesn't have uh, the medication, you can actually contact Healthcare Ready and they can help you try and address the problem. So I think we're trying to cover as many bases as possible, help as many people as possible, especially in light of all that's happening right now. So it's encouraging to hear that it's working um, and I hope people find it useful. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for that. A another issue that uh, has been brought up is, is the whole issue of um, telehealth. And I know that given COVID-19, 2020 certainly elevated the importance of Zoom and, and uh, talking to your doctors. Uh, and, and learning about medications through internet, uh, uh, through cell phones, through text messaging, you know, the whole idea of telehealth uh, and, and, and especially monitoring blood pressure or monitoring weight, those kinds of things. But uh, uh, Amy, what do you think uh, would be important for, for the elderly population, knowing that it's very hard for elderly to learn about computers Maybe 
maybe what I should say is the family approach to getting information, uh, people going online, uh, but getting telehealth information from the doctors and the clinics that elderly patients go to, what do you think would be important for for the adult children or children of, of the elderly to, to be able to partner and be a part of the team uh, in educating about, med especially the issue of their medicines, the diabetic patient, the high blood pressure patient, they, you know, they, they tend not to take the medicines or, or think they can, uh, you know, get away without taking them for a few days or a week. What do you think? So, you know, family caregivers are a critically important part of many older Americans' healthcare, and I think the pandemic has only, you know, increased the importance of family caregivers. We more often now see multiple generations living in the same household. And so, you know, and telehealth, as you mentioned, is a really great tool for a lot of folks who, especially older Americans, don't feel comfortable going into the doctor's office right now. Um, you know, we saw a massive drop off at the beginning of this pandemic of people who were filling a new prescription for the first time, which really means that people aren't going to the doctor. So, you know, where there are instances of older Americans living with family members who are acting as caregivers, that is a really good entry point for the, you know, introduction of telehealth and the use of different internet tools. You know, I would also say that there is um, a gap in access to broadband. And so, you know, access to telehealth is only as good as your access to broadband is. And that's another area that ARP has been focused on. Oh, very good. Yeah, if I, if I, if I may, yeah, uh, I like yeah. that. That's certainly something that's a top priority for Hispanic legislators. I mean, if you look at particularly his live in rural areas, right? Hispanics only connect, you know, through, through their phones, right? That that's their only mm -hmm. access to to the internet. And so we need to make sure that uh, folks have access to broadband, to quality internet connections, especially in rural areas. And I and I already have heard that some states will be focusing on this. I know that California, for example. Uh, given what's happened in the pandemic and how you know ch children have had to go to school online and 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 issues around telehealth, that California lawmakers are thinking of introducing a uh, broadband infrastructure uh, bond bill uh, next year, right? To be able to deploy the infrastructure needed uh, so that we don't have these challenges once again. So uh, they will be very focused on this uh, uh, the next uh, legislative session. That's good to hear, especially for our communities. Like you said, don't have that kind of access. That's very needed. Uh, Marissa, I'd like to just switch one other question that, that has been on, on the minds of, of a lot of the audience of the CHCI are looking for opportunities to advance their knowledge, especially in this area about pharmaceutical industry, about how medications are made so that they can be more knowledgeable for as as they become the future policymakers, right? And uh, could you tell us a little about opportunities for? And I'm going to say students that are in college, students that are in, uh, let's say, post college. You know, after they get out, young people looking for their first steps and uh, I'll say internships, but let me say paid internships, uh, opportunities for career advancement and networking among the many, many scientists and others who are working within pharma industry. I think it's a gold mine that we don't talk about. That's a great question, Dr. Rios. And I think um, working collaborati collaboratively is so important to address a lot of the issues that we have brought up uh, during this discussion, the health disparities and social determinants of health. Having people in the workforce that uh, are representative of those communities, I think will lead to such strong reforms that will um, make such an impact. So it is absolutely a key goal of the industry to both be hiring a more diverse workforce as well as uh, researching and uh, including diversity in all of the research that we do. Uh, there are a few opportunities. I'll note that in the coming days, we're about to roll out a new grant opportunity for people um, to uh, help address some of the social determinants of health. And I think, uh, again, we're really looking to lean on a lot of 
people in the community, including CHCI, to learn uh, and grow our, our experience in this space. So I think that there are a number of ways that we can work together here. I would also encourage people to visit uh, our, a website that we have set up. It's pharma.org slash equity. It outlines all the priorities that the industry is making to help address social determinants of health, uh, racism, and other issues that impact minority communities. Uh, and I think it's been a helpful tool. We have a lot to learn and a lot to do, but there are great opportunities here, uh, and we are, are very much looking forward to working with the community to address many of them. Great. Well, I, I, uh, I, I think that you all did a great job. Uh, I'm just going to say if there's any other closing comments, um, I, 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 think I, I think I heard your major priorities that, that uh, you, can, you have educated the audience uh, uh, very well today. Uh, but is there any other closing comment? Marissa? Thank you, Dr. Rios. I'll, I'll just close in saying that the biopharmaceutical industry is committing to helping all patients. Uh, I think it's important to also note we have several tools available to help with patients if they aren't able to afford their medicines. It's not meant to be a cure-all. It's more of a Band-Aid as these larger discussions happen. But for anybody who needs it, I would uh, encourage you to visit mat.org, M-A-T dot O-R-G. It is uh, a service where people can look and see what sort of uh, uh, assistance is available for their prescriptions. Mm -hmm. I would also encourage people to visit uh, our new equity website. It's pharma.org slash equity to look at uh, all the things that we are doing to um, address diversity in clinical trials, as well as throughout the industry. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be working with groups like CHCI and others in this very important space. So thank you so much. Right. And Amy, any, any other closing comment? Sure. So, you know, we know that there's broad consensus amongst older uh, adults of every demographic and of every political affiliation to lower prescription drug prices. That's why AARP has been so engaged on this issue. We've been working on this issue at the state and federal level, and we will continue to do so. We know that you know older Americans are really making choices between filling their prescription or buying their groceries, and the pandemic has only made this crisis worse. So AARP is very committed to this issue, and we will continue to work on these issues. Ken, any other closing comment? Sure. For NHTSL, I think what we're focused on is on the consensus of the healthcare community that uh, we need to move to models that uh, make uh, understanding, first of all, the, the way that drug pricing takes place, but also moving to more value-based uh, uh, outcomes. And so it's making sure that the price of drugs is not based on, on the actual cost, but actual outcome uh, for patients. And so that's something that state legislators are gonna be looking at. Of course, this pandemic uh, started when some legislatures uh, across the nation had already finished their session. And so uh, they haven't been back in their state capitals. And so we're looking forward to see what's going to happen in January. And same thing with Congress. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, I want to thank all of the panelists today. Uh, we've had a great, great time uh, together listening to a lot of, uh, I'm going to say, policy ideas that not everybody thinks about when they think about healthcare access and affordability, because understanding the world of the pharmaceutical industry and the medications that are so important to our communities is, is uh, part of that policy arena that we never hear about in our healthcare uh, conversations. So I think it was great to be able to see the interconnections from the perspective of the pharma industry from Marissa Watkins at, at Pharma, and also to hear the connection to our elderly community, and especially who relies on uh, Medicare and Medicare Part D for medications, Medicare Part D, B for the outpatient medications from Amy Selbick from AARP. And it was very nice to hear also from a leader from policymaking at the state levels across the country, including the information about Puerto Rico from Ken Romero, executive director of NCHSL. And I wanna thank the Congressional Hispanic uh, Caucus Institute for inviting me to be here today. I think that as a organiza represent an organization, the National Hispanic Medical Association, we represent Latino providers 
doctors and our networks of other health professionals that are nurses and dentists and pharmacists, mental health workers that are all working on the front lines, uh, helping our communities, especially now with COVID-19 and educating people about the importance of the flu season and educating people about the importance of, of taking medications, first of all, and not only taking them, and, but being able to uh, find ways of affording them, uh, having afford affordability uh, with their medications, whether it means getting insurance or taking advantage of patient assistance programs. And, and we hope that with the COVID-19 vaccines that are promising uh, from Pfizer and Moderna, that we will have more educational programs uh, in our communities to make sure that they are educated on the importance of having vaccines and taking the vaccines. Because even though we're gonna have all these vaccines, if our community doesn't take them, what good is, what good is that? We, we need to all work together to decrease this uh, horrible uh, virus that is ravaging uh, our Latino communities, especially. And uh, I'll just, uh, end with how important it is for CHCI to take on uh, the issue of affordability and accessibility of medications. And at the same time, understand that we do need innovative medications and we need more Latinos to get involved in research and especially in the pharma industry or doctors to take on patients in clinical trials, which is all part of the research arm of, of our medication innovation development. And I think it's just so important that we realize that all of, all of these issues are balanced and we look forward to working with the Biden-Harris uh, administration and the new Congress coming in January to continue to build affordable medications reform for our communities. Thank you very much.